I'm really pleased to welcome Dr. Sophia Vlila Roter. Um, uh, Sophia is a practicing clinical speech pathologist, but also an associate professor uh, in the Department of Com Communication Sciences and Disorders um, at the MGH Institute of Health Professions in Boston. And there, she is the co director there of the Cognitive Neuroscience Group. She received her PhD uh, from Harvard MIT Division of Health Sciences and Technology in 2014, and after that she joined uh, the faculty at MGH. Um, her research focuses on, she uses neuroimaging and, and behavioral methods to study the underlying mechanisms contributing to relearning in individuals with aphasia, and particularly the contribution of non-linguistic cognitive systems to success with therapy, and all that to improve clinicians' abilities to tailor treatment to individuals improving the predictability and efficacy of treatment for aphasia. So all that is highly relevant to uh, our audience interested in anything related to the study of aphasia recovery. Um, with that, I'm going to uh, first tell you what she's going to be talking about, which is exploring the role of learning in rehabilitation and communication. Um, please, audience, um, don't hesitate to start typing your questions in the chat box during the talk. We will deal, well, Dr. Falila Roter will deal with your questions after the talk, uh, and I will um, moderate those. With that, I'm going to give the floor to you, Sophia. All right, thank you so much. Uh, and thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm, uh, as many of you, I'm a big fan of the Seastar Lecture Series, so I'm excited to be here. Um, so as you mentioned, I'll be talking today about the expo exploring the role of learning in rehabilitation and communication. So from a very, very big picture, the big picture problem that many of the studies in our lab is trying to address is this idea that outcomes in aphasia rehabilitation lack predictability. Um, and we're not at a level yet where our treatment is really individualized. So if we imagine that we have two individuals with aphasia who come into our clinical practice, um, we can diagnose those individuals and then develop an intervention plan. But as many of us know, very frequently, we will have some pe people who respond to treatment and who show this nice treatment response, but we see other people who are not responding to treatment. Um, and so what this suggests is that there are mechanisms of therapy that aren't fully understood. And then the other piece where I'm gonna spend a lot of time today is talking about some of those individual characteristics about the person with aphasia that we're not fully measuring and capturing as well. Um, and spoiler alert, of course, the, the talk title lets you know that the area of focus that, that we're in here is in learning and how that might play a role um, in um, being some of this, this black box that we're not fully defining in our patients and in our interventions. Um, so when we're thinking about the process of rehabilitation, very often what happens first is we're going to assess the individual with aphasia um, from an impairment-based perspective, perhaps utilizing standardized assessments. And then hopefully we'll tap into also um, participation questions. So examining their participation, their personal environment, living with aphasia, their functional goals. Um, and then once we have that information, we're gonna develop an intervention plan and we're gonna have the person come in, right? So we're gonna see people repeatedly over over time. And in those sessions, what are we going to do? We're going to maybe utilize interventions that are supposed to strengthen their semantic network, strengthen their language system to improve access and use. We might spend time working on strategies to improve functional use of language. Um, so this is just an image of script training where we might practice some functional communicative contexts for those individuals. Um, or maybe we're going to work with somebody with aphasia um, with an AAC device, and we're going to spend time in the therapy room working to help support them to develop strategies and approaches that are going to help turn this into a functional communication device. Um, and then we hope that they are miraculously going to carry this out into the real world and that the strategies and the time that we spend in intervention working with an individual with aphasia is actually going to facilitate their communication and their participation in real life. Um, so when I look at this, and then I pulled up here just a dictionary definition of learning. Learning is defined as an activity or process of gaining knowledge or skill by studying, practicing, being taught, or experiencing something. When I look back at this schematic, there's a ton of learning, right? There's so many 
instances in the process of therapy where we are practicing, we're experiencing, we're being taught, we're learning compensatory strategies, we're facilitating lexical access. Um, and so when we look at rehabilitation, language profile and functional goals are going to determine the goals and targets of intervention. Absolutely. Aphasia is defined by difficulties with communication. But um, what we see is that learning really carries patients to achieve these. Um, and so I'm going to walk you through um, several studies that we're working on in lab where we are trying to look at this learning piece. Um, so where did a lot of uh, motivation and a lot of the research literature supporting the work come from? Uh, a lot of it comes from other clinical populations. Um, so there's been extensive research conducted in individuals with Parkinson's disease and amnesia. Um, so as you know, these are in amnesia, it's characterized by a memory deficit. Um, so that's why a lot of the work in learning and memory has come from individuals with amnesia. Um, but the work in this literature has, and, and in these clinical populations has shown us that sometimes changes in instruction method are critical for successful learning, even when to be learned material is the same. So if you have um, somebody who has to learn something, sometimes just changing the way that you present that material to be learned can actually all of a sudden unlock learning potential for someone who previously was unable to learn. Um, and why is this? Um, it's because there are actually multiple memory systems for learning. Um, so we recruit different cognitive and neural resources to learn when um, stimuli are presented in a certain way versus another. Um, and so memory systems are thought to interact or compete throughout learning um, and, and certain conditions are thought to perhaps emphasize the engagement of one system or another. Um, so we can manipulate the stimulus complexity, for example, we can manipulate stimulus timing, we can manipulate the presence or absence of feedback. And in doing all of those, um, making all of those changes to the instruction method, we actually are engaging different cognitive and neural resources that for a clinical population might actually be essential to facilitate that learning process. So um, from the, the amnesia and the Parkinson's um, research the, and these multiple memory systems, the, the multiple memory systems are really often discussed in these two cl major classifications, um, being implicit learning and explicit learning. So terms probably everyone is familiar with, um, but implicit learning is really describing this learning that occurs below conscious awareness and it describes learning that's gradually accrued through exposure. Um, and I put this figure here to remind myself that it's also well suited for learning complex um, patterns that require integration of information across multiple dimensions. Um, often an example is also a bicycle. You're aware that you're trying to learn, but you're actually integrating information from multiple systems, motor, sensory feedback, balance, visual. And so you're not really processing all of that in a conscious manner when you're learning to master and ride a bicycle. Um, explicit learning, on the other hand, is conscious and often it's verbalizable. Um, so if we take a kind of a, a, a similar example to the stimuli I showed you here, um, this is a category learning task that's often utilized in studies looking at implicit and um, rule-based learning. And what you see here, we have these um, stimuli that with these lines that differ on their orientation and their spatial frequency. And this category, um, the boundary is defined by a rule that's clearly verbalizable and that can be kind of, it can come into your conscious awareness quite quickly and then be explicitly applied. And that's in contrast to a category boundary that actually requires integration of both line and spaces. You kind of need to, get a sense of that category boundary over time through exposure. So um, where we've gone most recently in looking at this type of learning in people with aphasia is to go to some of the classic tests of implicit learning. Um, so the most classic tests of implicit learning utilized through many, many studies are the SRT and the AGL, and I'll explain both of those um, in depth. So we're using the SRT. What is the SRT? Um, so the serial response time task is a task that's typically set up where you'll have, for example, four stimulus dimensions on a screen, and I would have a button box, and I would be making a keyboard press or a button press that corresponded to the location of the yellow box. So I'm making a button press here, and then button press, button press, button press, button press, button press, button press. Um, so the, the SRT is referred to as a serial response time task. 
because the outcome measure of interest is to look at how quickly the button press is made in response to the stimulus item moving. Um, and unbeknownst to the participant, there's actually a sequence that's built into that SRT. So I'll talk about that a little bit more um, in our paradigm, but I wanted to set up the classic paradigm and show you that recent work um, has actually looked at this in a, in a manner where the stimulus modality, rather than being a button press, has actually been replaced with an eye gaze. So the SRT is gonna be exactly the same as the classic SRT, except instead of making a button press to indicate, I see it, I'm gonna press it, trigger a new response, um, you actually make an eye gaze where looking at the area where the trigger, where the item is, actually triggers um, the, the, the next trial onset and is the way that you log response times. Um, so I'll, I'll, hopefully that will make more sense in a second. Uh, but this is work that one of my master's students worked on, Diana Din, um, and Megan Schleep, who's now um, a PhD working at the Institute, worked on quite a bit. Um, but so what did we do? So this is our implicit SRT task. Um, that we have been collecting data on. And what it looks like is you have this screen where we have four shapes on the screen and there's this dot target that is moving into one of these shapes on any given trial. Um, and all participants have to do is they look at the screen and they're following this dot. Um, and what they complete is they complete multiple 60 trial experimental blocks and what we're measuring is their psychotic response time. So when their eye gaze comes to this dot, we, we measure how quickly they get there. And unbeknownst to the participant, in the first seven blocks of the experiment, the, the dot movement follows a sequence. So it, it follows a 12 movement sequence that's repeated over time. Then in block eight, it's referred to as our pseudo-random sequence, you actually change that sequence. So you pseudo-randomize the stimulus order meaning that this dot is no longer gonna follow that predictable pattern. Um, and then you, you return in blocks nine and 10 to a sequence. Um, and in the SRT literature and our prediction, so we're looking at response times, what's expected is that people, even though they're not consciously aware of the pattern that exists in this movement, um, what happens is their response time gets more, uh, gets faster because they can anticipate the movement. And then when you have that pseudo random block, all of a sudden their response times go way down um, if you look at their errors, the error rates spike. And then when you resume the sequence, response times come down. Um, so this is kind of, it's thought that the, the difference in this response time and this response time is kind of a measure of that implicit learning of the sequence. So um, that is a kind of a, cl a classic replication that we have carried out. And at the same time, so in our work, we're interested in seeing, okay, how do you learn this implicit SRT but then how do you learn something that's very similar, that looks the same, but this time we're gonna make it rule-based. We're gonna tell you what's happening. We're gonna set up your expectations. We're gonna teach you rules. And then we're gonna see if you can apply those rules um, in performing the task. So what do I mean by that? Um, so what I mean is here we have the same task. So we're gonna have those same four geometric shapes arranged in a diamond. Um, a dot is gonna move, but this time, dot movement is governed by rules. So this is an example of one of the tasks where there are two rules. So the rules are after circle, always diamond, after square, always triangle. So it looks something like this. Um, so they're gonna be told after circle, always diamond. And so here's a circle, whoops, here's a circle. You know that dot is gonna move into the diamond next. Rule two, after square, always triangle. You know, anytime the dot is in the square, it's always gonna move to the triangle. Now, after the triangle, however, the dot can actually move to any of these three positions. So um, if we're looking at movement after a circle, this is a rule governed trial because after the circle, I know based on these rules that the dot will go to the diamond. After the diamond, there's no rule that tells us where the dot will go. It can go to any of these three, um, three shapes. That represents what we refer to as a non-rule governed trial. Um, so the participant simply has to follow the dot this time when it moves. Whereas if it lands in the square, I know that after square, it's gonna go to the triangle. So I, can, I have information that allows me to predict where that dot is gonna go. And so my psychotic response time, my eye is gonna go there faster on these rule governed trials than on non-rule governed trials. Um, so within the same task, there are rule-governed trials 
interspersed with non-rule governed trials. Um, and what we look at is we break those trials up. We say, let's look at the average response time for rule governed trials. Let's look at the average response time for non-rule governed trials. And the expectation is that for those rule governed trials, because you know where the dot is going to move, you move there more quickly. In the non-rule governed trials, you're truly making a movement in response to where the dot is moving. And so we expect those rule governed trials um, to, uh, to have a, fast, a slower response time. So we expect this difference in response time for rule governed and not rule governed. Um, and we were curious to see um, how this panned out in control participants as well as people with aphasia. Um, so remember, we're, we're having participants who are, who are carrying out this classic implicit SRT using eye gaze as a response. And then in our lab, we developed this rule-based version where we taught two simple rules for them to apply. And we were curious to see if they could apply that um, with a possible hypothesis being that people with aphasia might have more difficulty applying a verbal rule. Um, and might do better with the implicit task. So what did we see? Um, so we have data so far from 31 young adult controls. This is really to establish baseline behaviors. Uh, we have a, a 31 older adult controls, and this sample is really intended to match the age range of the people with aphasia that we see. Um, and then we have data from 14 individuals with aphasia. And if we start with the implicit task, um, here is the implicit data. So um, you're looking on, along the x-axis here at the blocks. So S represents a block that's sequence. So we have seven sequence blocks. PS represents a block where it's pseudo-randomized. So the order of that dot movement all of a sudden is scrambled up. And then S9, we resume the sequence. And then along the y-axis here, we're looking at normalized response times. And what you see is absolutely the predicted behavior. So we're replicating the SRT effect where over time, uh, unbeknownst, without necessarily explicit knowledge of the sequence, people's response times are getting much, 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 much smaller or faster. Then we, we change that pattern. The response times go way up. They slow down. Um, and then we resume the sequence, and we see um, them resume these rapid response times. We have parallel graphs for error rates. You see the exact same pattern in the error rates. Uh, when we look at the older adult controls, our older adult sample also showed this same pattern. So they're getting gradually faster. Um, and then they spike, they get much slower, and then they get faster again when the sequence resumes. And then of course our people with aphasia. So right now it's a smaller sample, but when we look at the individuals with aphasia, we do see evidence of implicit learning at the group level. Um, when we look at this uh, comparison, so this is the, the strongest comparison, the greatest comparison of interest, we do see a significant difference in the response times for this pseudo-random block relative to um, the sequenced block that we would expect. Um, then if we move to rule-based, so now we wanted to see performing a task with similar demands, but a different structure, are people learning the rules and then applying them? And how does that vary across our groups? Um, so what we're seeing in our initial data, so remember here blue are the rule governed trials that we expect a faster response time. Orange is the non-rule governed trials. And we actually see that all three groups are showing a very strong effect. Um, so they show that evidence of anticipation or application of the rules. Um, and whereas we had expected perhaps to see a smaller difference in our individuals with aphasia, we didn't see that. Um, so we see strong evidence of rule application across all groups. Um, now this may be that this particular rule-based task is, is it's a pretty simple rule. Um, they're pretty simple rules and they can also be very, they're also very visual in nature. Um, so the next project I'll talk to you about probes a process of more complex rule-based learning. Um, but for now, in this initial project, we saw that the people with aphasia were able to apply those rules. But I started this talk talking to you about individual differences. And that's really where the focus of our analyses and the focus of our work is. And so if we look at individual learner profiles on these two tasks, and here I'm going to look only at the individuals with aphasia, what we find is that we have a subset of individuals with aphasia that are actually rule-based learners only, and they didn't show evidence of learning on the implicit SRT. So they didn't show that same change in response time from the sequence block to the pseudorandom block. Then in contrast, we have another subset of people with aphasia who were implicit only learners. So they actually learned the implicit SRT, but then when we gave them the rule-based version of the task, they didn't show evidence of a difference in response time on the rule-based and the non-rule-based um, blocks. So this suggests, this is the beginning to suggest that there are 
individual learner profiles. And this adds to evidence of work that I didn't include here that was prior category learning work that I carried out when I was working with Swathi over at BU. So consistently, we're seeing profiles of differential learning in our people with aphasia. And then we have this subset here that are labeled non-learners. Um, I don't think that these are people who are not capable of any learning, but they didn't show learning to criterion on these particular tasks within this short time frame of instruction. Um, but importantly, we do see these profiles of differential learning among the people with aphasia. So another way that we're looking at learning and the other kind of classic test of implicit learning are artificial grammars. Um, and so many of you are probably familiar with these kind of structures that show you the patterns of an artificial grammar. So the way you read an artificial grammar is kind of from left to right. Um, and what this kind of map tells you is what is a, a legal um, pattern versus what is an illegal pattern. So if we take this verbal one, you could start with Pell. Pell next has to go to Vot, but then Vot can be followed by either Pell or Jack. All that to show you that now we're still learning a sequence or a pattern but it's more complex than the SRT pattern, right? The SRT was just 12 movement sequence repeated over and over and over. Um, that's a serial response. It's just a simple sequence. Artificial grammars are really interesting and looked at quite a bit in language research because their, their structure is thought to mimic this hierarchical relationship that language has. So for example, in language, a, um, an article can be followed by a noun, but an article isn't going to be followed by a verb. Now, there are multiple nouns that can slot into that place, um, but there aren't any verbs that are going to kind of slot into that position. And so that's somewhat more similar to this artificial, the, the artificial grammar is somewhat more similar to the syntactic structure of natural language. So we've started collecting data, and this is um, data, uh, work that was supported by a master's student, Natasha Denovi and a doctoral student, Carla Hendricks. Um, and so here I've shown you, I'm gonna focus um, here on the rule-based versus implicit, but we also did a visual versus auditory condition. Um, so what does that look like? So the observational AGL. So notice I'm, I'm backing off from the word implicit a little bit um, because while these are designed as implicit learning tasks, um, the more work we do in this area, the more we realize that it really depends on the participant's approach. Um, but so this is an observational condition, at least, in that they're learning passively through exposure and through the process of gradual and repeated exposure, the expectation is that people might learn. So in the task setup that we have, um, we replicated some prior work where you first see one screen with a sequence that can be anywhere from two to six shapes long. And then after three, you see it for three seconds, it disappears, you see another sequence for three seconds, and your job is to determine, do these, do these sequences match or not match? Um, now this setup is intended to help them pay attention. So you make sure they're looking at it, they're making a judgment, but they're not instructed that there's a sequence or a pattern that they're supposed to be learning or looking for. So in our current paradigm, people were taught or exposed to 23 unique grammatical strings in training. Uh, they were presented eight times each. Um, there were on 46 matching and 46 non-matching pairs. It took about 20 minutes of exposure. And then after having this exposure phase or this training phase, they switched to testing. And at this point we tell them, oh, there was actually, there were some rules that were governing those patterns you saw. And we asked people to then look at sequences. We, they look at 16 novel sequences that they've never seen before and 16 sequences on which they were trained. And we asked them to say, on each of these trials, let us know, tell us if you think this aligns with the rules that you saw um, that, that were governing the patterns you saw before or not. Um, so kind of do these follow, are, are these grammatical or ungrammatical uh, without using the word grammatical. So that's this observational condition. Um, this mimics and parallels how multiple studies looking at implicit AGL learning have been set up. And then what we did is we have developed a rule-based AGL. Why? Well, again, we're eventually trying to think about clinical practice. In clinical practice, rarely, sometimes we're showing people stimuli and we're having them practice language, but without giving them necessarily verbalizable rules that they have to apply. But we have a lot of other interventions where we're actually teaching participants rules about language. Um, for example, the treatment of underlying forms really leverages this idea of teaching them, giving them meta knowledge about syntax to then um, create sentence structures that follow those rules. 
So we take this AGL and we've broken the AGL down into five rules. And we developed a paradigm that was computer-based and walked people with aphasia through the process of learning these five rules sequentially. Um, so often they, they find out the rule and they read it and they hear it. So it says the sequence must begin with circle or pentagon. And they see some examples of the sequence that follows the rule and then we reinforce the rule. Um, and we were, we were curious to see, can people learn this, right? It feels really hard, um, but you'll see if you get to, you know, in running this, you get to see that we really, we repeat the rules so often that we're really, really trying to give multiple, multiple opportunities to experience the rule and reinforce the rule. So they gain exposure to the rule and then they're kind of probed on their rule knowledge. So they would learn a rule and then they would be asked, is this allowed? And they have to make a response, yes or no, and they'll receive feedback yes or no, but then that reinforces the rule. That's right. A sequence can only begin with circle or pentagon or no. Remember, a sequence can only begin with circle or pentagon. So they're getting um, lots of repeated exposures to these rules. Um, and what happens is we also only move on to a second rule once their responses demonstrate some acquisition of that rule. Um, so basically on each, for each rule, learning uh, in, in the process of each rule, uh, introducing a new rule, we have a new rule. And then we have this feedback-based learning where there are yes, no questions related to the new rule. And on each trial, they receive feedback, correct or incorrect, correct or incorrect. And then we have a rule review where they're asking questions, um, but this time they're not getting feedback. And we're actually calculating the accuracy of their performance here and, they, and then they perform a, this rule probe where they actually have to reach a certain criterion level of accuracy before we'll go on and teach them rule two. Because if they haven't mastered rule one, why are we just going to keep bombarding them with new information? Um, and so we, we go through this process and we'll teach them up to five rules. In this initial pilot phase of the study, we actually were also timing them at the same time. And we stopped rule instruction after 20 minutes, um, regardless of where they had reached. We did that so that we matched the training time between the implicit or observational AGL and the rule-based AGL. Um, so we have just a little bit of data to share here. Um, we have some pilot data from seven individuals with aphasia and eight age-matched controls. Um, now, when you look at our table of participants here, you will see that we do have a few participants who are quite high on their aphasia quotient. Um, this is, you know, this is the first initial stages where we first wanted to make sure this wasn't torturous and painful for individuals with aphasia. Um, and we're extending our sample to have people with a broader range of severities. But I just wanted to acknowledge that many of these have high aphasia quotients. Um, they do have aphasia, but um, we kind of have a sample right now that's skewed a little bit in the higher level, um, just because we wanted to, 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 to make sure our training paradigm was learnable. But we do have a few people um, with aphasia ranges that are kind of in, in, a, in a greater severity. And we have two individuals with Broca's aphasia. And when we look at their results, so here I'm going to the implicit results. So this is looking at that observational learning. Um, and um, I didn't focus today on the auditory task, but we did have an auditory uh, artificial grammar. So words, non-words spoken in sequence versus this visual sequence. And when we compare the controls to the individuals with aphasia, there aren't any major differences. What we do see is we're not seeing scores that are, that are much higher above chance. These do at the group level, we do see learning, um, but what we've learned through this is that we probably need greater exposure. We need to increase the, the exposure trials for our implicit task. Um, if I look at the rule-based task, what we see is the control group had higher rule-based accuracy than the individuals with aphasia. Not um, hugely surprising perhaps when you think about the language, cognitive, attentional demands of learning those rules, retaining those rules, and then applying those rules. But then again, when we look at the individual level, um, so looking at the individual level here, I have controls on the left-hand side and individuals with aphasia on the right-hand side. Interestingly, even though the people with aphasia had lower scores overall on rule-based compared to um, the controls, so the, the individuals with aphasia have lower rule-based scores than the control participants, but at the individual participant level, they're still showing better learning in the rule-based task. Now that may come from um, our implicit task not providing sufficient exposure and we're working on tweaking that right now, um, but we do see basically evidence of individuals with aphasia being capable of learning this pretty complex AGL 
and being able to apply the rules. And we even see, I wanted to highlight, these are our individuals who had diagnoses of Broca's aphasia who were a little lower on the severity quotient, um, and they do show evidence of being able to learn and apply those rules. So next steps, so much work to be done here, right? So I've shared with you kind of pilot and preliminary data, um, but our big questions now are to ask, are these profiles? We're starting to see, we, we're seeing evidence of people being able to learn in certain conditions and not others and learning being stronger in one condition or another. Now what we have to do is determine if these behaviors are replicable. So do we see one person who shows consistent learning under rule-based conditions and not these observational conditions um, one day and then three months later? Um, also, we have to answer questions about this relationship between language profile and learning profile. And then also what is the relationship between their stroke and their learning profile? Um, and so these are all questions that we're currently working to answer now. We have an NIH funded grant um, where we're collecting data on these tasks and we're also collecting data, we're collecting uh, structural MRI data so that we can begin to answer questions about learning profile, stability of learning profile or replicability of learning profile. And then also look at brain behavior relationships and language profile behavior relationships. Um, okay, so in, where are we? Okay, we're in good shape. Um, so now this is all very abstract and utilizing tasks that are not very similar to what we're doing in therapy in intervention with actual people with aphasia. So in line, we're doing a lot of thinking about um, looking towards the literature in aphasia rehabilitation and where we see these questions addressed and where we see the greatest evidence of research looking at learning instruction is in the world of anomia intervention. Um, so this is work that is largely driven by Kristen Nunn, one of my doctoral students. And what you see here are schematics of error-less learning, error-full learning, and retrieval practice. So there's quite a, a um, there's a considerable body of literature that looks at anomia intervention. So intended to improve lexical access for a target, for example, Apple. And in error-less learning, a participant is shown an Apple, um, but the, the, the clinician immediately says Apple and has the participant repeat Apple in order to reduce or eliminate the possibility for errors. Now there are other conditions. This has been, there's been, there have been comparative effectiveness studies that look at the efficacy of that type of intervention relative to an intervention where errors are not controlled for. So you see the stimulus and then you tell the participant, you tell me what the name of this is, and then they might get it right, they might get it wrong, and you give feedback um, based on their response, you provide feedback and you move on. There is also within this literature work that has been looking at retrieval practice, which interestingly retrieval practice actually combines some of the best aspects of errorless and errorful learning. Um, the learning environment is set up so that people have familiarization to the correct target. Um, so it increases their likelihood of being correct, but in that instance of retrieval, it's still effortful in that they're not just directly repeating um, the stimulus response association immediately. So, when we look at, if we focus on error-less and error-full, and we're thinking about the mechanisms of therapy and the proposed and hypothesized mechanisms of therapy and what we're doing in intervention, in error-less learning, it's thought that um, a stimulus response association is being reinforced. So often it's cited these Hebbian mechanisms of plasticity where you're strengthening a stimulus response association through repetition. If an, a finicky error gets in there, that might interrupt the stimulus response connection. And that's why the context is manipulated to avoid or eliminate errors just to strengthen this. Models that look at errorful learning, or I'll call it learning where errors are not controlled for or prevented, talk about this being a gated mechanism. Um, and so I've kind of created a cartoon depiction that's based on a model proposed by Lehman Ralph and Fillingham in 2007. But in this model, they propose that this stimulus response association is gated when errors are not controlled for, because someone, when somebody proposes a response, they then have to detect errant behavior. So you make a response and then you have to find out, is it correct or incorrect? And that can come internally or externally. Then there has to be memory coding of that response and that feedback. And all of that requires attentional executive support to gate and uh, correct those errors. Um, and so a lot of work that we're carrying out now in lab is focusing in on this piece. So as we look at 
this errorful learning or learning in context where errors are not controlled for. If you think about rehab, it's a ton of what we do, right? The, the, the challenge about errorless learning is it's not natural, right? We're trying to create context that will facilitate communication in a real environment. What happens in a real environment? Errors are made and then feedback is given um, in different forms. Um, but thinking about how that feedback is given and how that feedback is processed, we're starting to think is probably really important to study in people with aphasia. So um, how, where are we starting with this? Um, so looking at that feedback, this idea of getting positive or negative feedback and whether people are processing it um, is work that we're doing in collaboration with Yael Arbel, who is over at the Institute of Health Professions. And she has been utilizing electroencephalography to measure feedback processing, particularly in pediatric populations. But she's interested in, the develop in pediatric populations and how they process feedback in the process of learning. And we've been utilizing this knowledge and collaborating with her to start to understand feedback processing in adults with the goal of applying this to people with aphasia. Um, so uh, this project Kristen Nunn is working on uh, as well, and my doctoral student Victoria Bolowski and a former master's student Bobby Creighton worked on. But what are we doing here? So EEG is measuring, so we're able to measure the electrical activity in the brain as people are performing tasks. And we're focusing particularly on something called the feedback-related negativity. Um, so what that is, is it's an, it's an event-related potential that is evoked about 250 to 300 milliseconds after the presentation of feedback. So somebody sees something, they make a response, they get feedback, and then 230 milliseconds after that present, presentation of feedback, an FRN is, is elicited, and that FRN is thought to reflect the degree to which that feedback is informative or is utilized. Um, and so work has shown that the FRN magnitude is associated with learning outcomes. It makes sense. So when studies look at when you have the possibility for errors, studies have shown that receiving feedback is really important for future successful learning because you have to, if you make an error, you have to be, become aware of that error. And then you have to have some way to use that error to correct your future behavior. Um, and so the FRN has, gives us a really nice way to measure that at the electrophysiological level. And then to see if that does influence learning and then our goal is to now co eventually collect data in people with aphasia to see if we do see these signs of feedback processing and if we see variability in feedback processing ability among our people with aphasia. So where have we started? Um, so, so far, uh, we just published a study actually that looked at a category learning task. Um, so some of you, if you know my work, you know that I've worked with these animals before, but basically what it is is we've taught people these complex visual categories. So they learn to categorize animals as belonging to a category A or category B. We manipulated, we had two task conditions. Um, one, where the training was feedback-based or trial and error or errorful, you could call it. Um, they see a stimulus item. They have to guess to which category that item belongs. I'm gonna make a guess. And then they receive feedback indicating whether their guess was correct or incorrect. And they carry out multiple learning trials um, and then they have to apply this in a testing phase. And then they can they carry out another condition, which is an observational condition, where the to be learned material is the same. We actually have two stimulus sets and we counterbalance all of this, um, but they're learning essentially a very similar category. Um, but we also look at observational learning, or you could call it error less learning, where you see a stimulus item and you're immediately told the category to which it belongs. You have to make a button press to kind of keep the motor response the same across the two task conditions. And then you just go through multiple, multiple, multiple trials. So we're doing the stimulus response association on the, in the observational condition. And we're, um, whereas we're, we're engaging participants in feedback-based learning or trial and error learning in the feedback-based condition. So in this paper that we just published, we looked at data from 38 young adults because we're kind of looking to characterize this in a, in a baseline uh, young adult population. And we were interested in looking at accuracy of learning across the two conditions, strategy of learning across the two conditions. And then for the feedback condition, we wanted to we utilize EEG and analyzed ERPs to look at the feedback processing. So to give you um, just a snippet of what we see, um, when we look at accuracy, overall accuracy was matched for the observational training condition 
and the feedback-based condition. So our control participants were equally able to learn under this observational condition and the feedback-based condition. Now, when we look more closely into the data and we say, okay, but how are you achieving that success? What we can do is we've developed some, we have some analytical models that let us get a sense of whether in the process of making that categorical decision, is the person paying attention to one feature and one feature only? For example, anytime I see spots, I'm gonna say it's category A. Anytime I see stripes, I'm gonna say it's category B, even though I know this is tiny, but within category A, there are items with stripes. This, um, the category boundary for this task is defined by animals sharing a majority of their features with a category prototype. But we can actually look at their responses over time and we can see, we can actually create models that, that demonstrate what the response pattern would look like if they were basing their response only on one feature in each trial versus a response that's more optimal where they're actually accruing information from multiple features um, with each response. Um, so it's kind of a, a quick version of explaining these strategies, but the take home message is that the condition of instruction actually influenced the strategies that were developed. Or in other words, in this um, observational condition, we saw a larger number of people using the single feature strategy, which is in blue, compared to the feedback-based condition where fewer individuals were using a single feature strategy. Um, so big picture here, the take home is that the task instruction method is influencing maybe the way that people are approaching the task, even though their overall accuracy is, is comparable. Um, now for the feedback condition, what we were interested in is looking at feedback processing. So when we look at the FRM, elicited by learners under the feedback-based task, what we saw is that those people who base their responses on the presence or absence of one feature. So again, this is you saying, whenever I see spots, I'm gonna say A, and you know what? Sometimes there are stripes, but I'm just gonna go with spots are A, stripes are B. What we saw from the ERP data is that people who utilize a single feature strategy over time showed a decreased FRN. Um, so unfortunately the, the FRN is a negative going um, ERP. So this change here is actually showing a decrease in FRN from early training trials to late training trials. In real words, what does that mean? What that means is that people, the, these, this group of users essentially stopped using feedback to inform their responses. Makes sense, right? I got a strategy, I'm gonna stick to it. Sometimes it's gonna be an X, but you know what? I'm just not gonna use that because it's not informative to me. So that was a really interesting and important pilot work, initial work for us to see that we can elicit the FRN on this task. And we do see a difference in feedback processing based on strategy development. So now what we wanna do is we wanna apply this in people with aphasia. So remember, I talked to you about when there is the potential for errors, there's feedback that's presented, and then you have to use that feedback to update your responses and then influence your future behavior. Well, now we're gonna carry out, Kristen is actually um, gonna start data collection very soon that looks to measure this. So how can we quantify feedback processing in our individuals with aphasia and how does that relate to their learning profile, their language profile and their intervention plan long-term? Um, okay, I'm gonna give you a little snippet. Oh, I don't have too much time. So much exciting stuff to talk about. So um, here I'm gonna do a quick transition. Another thing that we're looking at in learning um, is confronting assumptions about learning in the process of therapy. So what do I mean here? Um, so this is work that Victoria Bolowski, a doctoral student is carrying out right now. Um, that's very exciting. And so here you see this little schematic here, which many of you might recognize as SFA, right? This is the table for semantic feature analysis. It's a, an intervention that has demonstrated strong eff effectiveness. Um, it's thought to, from a mechanistic perspective, here it's thought to stimulate the language system through feature activation. Um, so you have this activation of features and studies have shown that working on this feature activation, engaging people in SFA helps improve access of those targets. So lexical access is facilitated by an activation of those features. And then we even see generalization to improve lexical access to other items within that category that weren't trained in therapy. Great. Um, now, the limitations of, 
of um, SFA, or maybe I said challenging the assumptions, right? I titled this transition challenging the assumptions because SFA shows strong benefits and we see evidence of the mechanism. We, we see evidence of the mechanism at play when we see this improved lexical access for trained and untrained items within a category. Now our question, and when Victoria is spending her time is thinking about now what happens when they're in the wild? <laughs> when this person is actually in a functional communicative environment, some SFA studies suggest that this secondary mechanism or secondary effect of SFA is that they're internalizing the structure. So when I am a person with aphasia and a word, I have a loss for a word, maybe all this practice with SFA has helped me internalize the structure and I can utilize it to facilitate my lexical access. Or also I've carried out all this feature activation, maybe in my real world communication, I'm gonna move beyond just having to say apple and I'm gonna think, ah, it's a crunchy fruit, teachers, boom. If I'm working with a communication partner that is going to um, facilitate and support the communication and all of a sudden I'm gonna have a functional exchange. Now this is where we are suspecting and we're starting to see pilot data that supports this hypothesis that there are a lot of assumptions in that. So what Victoria is doing is she is putting this at the forefront of her treatment study. So she's carrying out an SFA study, a study that utilizes an SFA framework, but she is providing explicit instruction about what that framework is. She spends a ton of the therapy time actually teaching them the framework, teaching them the purpose of the framework and teaching people to internalize that framework. And then she's also spending a lot of time building meta awareness of how useful this can be. So she says, part of the protocol is within five seconds, can you name it or not? Is the word coming? If it's not, move on. What else can you tell me about this word? Because she's helping them gain this recognition of, oh, when I can't come up with a word, I gotta start saying other stuff. And that's gonna support my functional communication. Um, and in her probes, she is having probes that are parallel to other SFA studies where she is looking at lexical access over time of trained, untrained related and untrained unrelated items and categories. She's also quantifying, are they able to express the structure of SFA? It doesn't have to be through words, any way they wanna communicate that. Can they show evidence of internalizing that structure in probes? And hopefully you will get to attend a conference where she's speaking about this, but spoiler alert, we think we're making the assumption that people with aphasia are internalizing this. It's a lot more like this for some of our people with aphasia. Um, and so this is really getting us to think about how, and it ties into learning in that maybe we should be spending our therapy time giving more explicit instruction about what are we trying to do and how can I empower you to utilize and leverage this in a functional communication context to really help promote that generalization to outside targets and to outside contexts. Um, so we have a, a lot of work here, um, but hopefully that will be that will be coming out soon. Um, and so uh, kind of big take homes, we've, we've talked through these individual learner profiles that we started to measure in people with aphasia. Um, and we've utilized these SRT tasks and the AGL, um, talking about in our interventions, what is happening when we have the potential for errors? And then how are we managing those errors for patients? And what are people, um, how are people with aphasia processing that feedback if they are processing it? And can we begin to quantify that in individuals with aphasia? And then thinking about therapy and intervention practices and how we can be put an intentional lens on, let's teach them some aspects of what it is to be a speech therapist to, to kind of um, provide the intervention themselves if we want them to use this in the wild, say in a functional communicative context. Um, and this last bit, so I will skip this just in the interest of time, but I will just plan to see that we're doing some really um, fascinating work that is exploring aspects of personality and communication. So we are working on adapting measures of risk-taking. Um, so risk-taking behaviors, what is your um, social risk-taking level? What is your physical risk-taking level? What is your impulsivity? And then measuring how that relates to um, spontaneous speech, really uh, story retells. So I'll skip through those just as a snippet. Hopefully I'll get to talk about those some other day. Um, and I'll just finish up with one last little plug, right? Yeah, for an upcoming conference. So um, there, another line of my research is in implementation science. So as Dirk mentioned in the beginning, I do still hold a clinical role and we do a lot of implementation work and I'm actually helping to 
um, set up a, an implementation science conference that will be virtual happening in April. So I wanted to make a little plug for that um, and thank the team and the Aphasia Center and all of our participants for all of their time and energy. And I'm excited to see your questions. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Sophia. What a, what a nice talk. Um, the uh, cyberspace can hardly hold the number of questions that we uh, already have in the chat box. So uh, let's go. So the first question uh, is from Mick McNeil, um, one of our former speakers. He says, uh, number one, has, he has two questions. Have you looked at the relationship? Oh, and he says, thanks for an excellent talk. Have you looked at the relationship of the eye tracking data to manual response data? And then two, have you explored the shape targets with written words and do you see different patterns of implicit learning between the two types of stimuli or responses, manual response time versus eye tracking times? Great question. So thank you for those questions. So we haven't looked at the difference between the manual response and the visual response, but um, prior labs have. Um, so there has been, there was a really fascinating study where they, they, they carried out learning where people learned the SRT via the visual modality, and then they didn't undergo more learning, but they, they like all of a sudden had a button press version and they showed evidence of carryover from the visual modality to the button modality. So it's not like it's just this ocular motor pattern that's being learned. There was some internalization of the structure that actually carried over to when they were making a button response. Um, so we haven't done that work. I think it would be fascinating, but there is some work that has shown that transfer. Um, and then you talk about the shape targets with written words. That's very interesting. Yeah, so we also haven't done that. Interestingly, I suspect that for people with aphasia, that would introduce a new challenge. So I suspect that there we would actually see differences um, because in the process, so there, um, uh, Sushard and Cindy Thompson have done some work where they have looked at SRT um, so they were looking at sequences and there they did look at phonemic sequences versus um, sequences where it was just um, just patterns and they do see that for individuals with aphasia when you increase the language processing demand um, they do see some evidence of a selective deficit in implicit learning when that task demand is increased to tasks uh, language so I, I suspect we would see a difference in people with aphasia with that type of modality change. Right. Gordon asks, uh, what kind of aphasia? And that was particularly uh, related to the first experiments that you were talking about. And I had a follow up on that, um, whether the learner types that you distinguished, were they associated with different severity or different aphasia profiles? Great questions as well. Um, so, and I can actually switch. Um, so we didn't see that, and I apologize that I didn't say who these people were with aphasia, um, but initially, so the literature and our predictions would be that, so individuals who have more agrammatic aphasia or non-fluent aphasia are suspected The Michael Ullman proposed this declarative procedural model that suggests that individuals with an agrammatic deficit might have deficits in this implicit procedural learning of sequences. Um, and so we initially looked at the data to see if that surfaced um, and we didn't see it. Um, and that is where the, the work in the aphasia world that has looked at SRT task learning and AGL learning has really focused on these non-fluent individuals with agrammatic aphasia. And we haven't seen evidence of with this link between agrammatic aphasia and a deficit in implicit sequence learning. Um, so that did not bear out in our sample. Um, we looked for it, it didn't bear out. Severity, we saw a very interesting pattern in, in our prior category learning work. What we saw is, so um, you know those animals with multiple features. So it's non-linguistic, but nothing is non-language, right? We are humans, we're, we're, we tend to utilize language. And so, and in this single feature, right? Often people are using verbalizable strategies. Um, what we saw in that category learning task is that those people with the most severe aphasia and those people with the least severe aphasia learned the best. And when we look at their strategies, they were actually making response patterns that suggested that they were accruing information across multiple dimensions. Those people in the middle were the ones who actually showed disrupted learning. And what I think is happening there is those people in the middle have access to language, 
they try to use language, but they can't use it efficiently. And so interestingly, in the process of trying to utilize language and having some access to language, they actually just muck up implicit systems that could occur better. Those people who have such severe aphasia that they just can't even, I suspect they're, they're like, I'm not even gonna go with it with a verbal approach. I'm just making button presses. Their brains are actually learning those statistical regularities using this dopaminergic reward system and they're able to learn. Um, so we kind of, did, we did some like dual task work to try to look at that, um, but great questions. Sorry, long answers for fantastic questions. Thank you. Um, a question by Julius Fredrickson. On the initial SRT task, were there any implicit only learners or non-learners in the control groups? Great question. Um, so for the SRT task, so for the controls, we had a, a very small subset of non-learners, but not too many. Most of them learned through one or the other. Um, we did have some, I don't think we had any implicit only, but we had some rule-based only um, for that SRT. Um, so we did have some control participants who at the individual subject level didn't show this strong difference in response time between the sequence and the pseudo-randomized. So the follow-up to that is for individual differences on the SRT task, do you think that reflects something specific to aphasia? That is, would you expect similar results in persons with brain damage of comparable size but no aphasia? Yeah, great question. I don't think it's specific to aphasia. I think that we would expect to see those deficits especially for the implicit task, for example, because the implicit, implicit learning isn't thought to recruit language resources. It's thought to be a task that it's implicit, right? So we're not using language to learn. Um, I do think, and there's some work that suggests that we might have a propensity for one type of learning or another kind of naturally. Some work suggests that even like in the, in the pediatric world, um, there are thought to be maybe some like hormone relationships between the seesaw balance between these systems. Um, some theories propose that if you're if you're recruiting implicit systems, you're actually kind of seesawing, you're downregulating the the explicit systems and vice versa. Um, and so I suspect, I think that we, I think that the, some of us are equally great at both. I think some of us have a go-to, so to speak. I think when we are individuals without brain damage, we very fluidly move between them. And if a task poses demands that are better suited for one system or another, we just toggle that way. I think for any type of brain damage, there is a potential for a weakness in one of those pathways. And I think that then it's it's a battle of the, the learner and their preference and the task and its demands. And when it's, there's a true mismatch, you might just keep trying to follow the wrong avenue to learn and you can't do it versus if you're not so stubborn a learner in that way and you can flip over and you still have integrity in those pathways, maybe you'll, you'll see some. Thank you. Um, Enriqueta Canseco Gonzalez asks, would patients behave differently in the implicit grammar task if they were presented with words rather than pictures? That is, they may approach the task differently when they assume it is language versus not. I think we did Absolutely. talk about it. Yeah, definitely. Um, yes, so I do think that the, the words adds a, a, an extra demand on phonological processing and, and maybe even kind of some, some, some deeper language processing. And so uh, I do think we might expect to see that. Um, you know, that's, that is a chat. We do a lot of visual learning work in lab, which is why I kind of mentioned we're, we're, we're also trying to look at some of these word learning because we've tried to tease apart the language from the learning. But as a result, we are currently proposing posing kind of high demands on the visual learning system. Nikita also asks, uh, would FRN vary depending on whether the learning is implicit or explicit? Uh, that's a great question. Um, it might. Um, so there's not a, so some sources will suggest that the FRN is going to be a stronger marker of implicit learning. I'm not 100% uh, on board with that being a strong characterization of implicit. So the FRN is generated by the anterior cingulate and corticostriatal loops. And those are so strongly tied to feedback, right? And in some literature, feedback, dopaminergic reward becomes synonymous with implicit. But I think that um, we have to be really cautious about making that uh, a synonym and a synonymous relationship because what we've found in our work is that just because there's feedback it doesn't mean that people aren't approaching the task with a very explicit strategy. And so in that sense, 
you might have an explicit strategy where you're strongly utilizing the FRN to inform your decision. You know, there's actually some, some later evoked potentials that I think would mo more clearly map to um, the implicit or explicit distinction, because then you can see more evidence of kind of this conscious processing and what you do with it afterwards. Question, which is kind of related to what Julius was asking and also related to the answer you gave on the severity issue where you talked about this U-shape, right? So the, so in essence, it's about this question to what extent uh, the implicit learning has a verbal um, substrate, if you will. The implicit learning tasks, how do you assess the participant's awareness or non-awareness of the actual rule? Uh, yes. To what extent does the implicit learning rely on the participant making the rule explicit to themselves, possibly by verbalizing it? Mm -hmm. Is this for the AGL or the SRT? Was there a specification in the question? Say any, but any. Mean, it, it was it, it was based on the first uh, experiments that you showed. Got it. There. Okay. Yeah. Sure thing. Um, so we do a rule probe, a, a knowledge probe afterwards, um, where what we do is we and and this was based off of other studies that look at the SRT. So at the end of the learning, what you do is you say, okay, here are three trials. And then you say, what's next? And so you do a knowledge probe and you look at their accuracy and you see if they're above chance or below chance. Um, in our sample, we, we get a lot of below, people aren't performing above chance, so they're not gaining this explicit awareness, um, particularly in the older adults and the people with aphasia. Um, there have been work where you see that some people gain conscious awareness. Now, some studies have manipulated the other way and they say, we're gonna do a task, here's how it works. And they, 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 they have people perform the SRT and they found that actually that explicit awareness of the presence of a sequence from the get-go actually disrupts the implicit learning process, um, surprisingly. So again, when you try it, you just get, you muck yourself up, you get yourself in trouble because the sequence is actually longer than your short-term memory span. And so you actually um, are better just if you let your brain do its thing. Um, Oh, well, we've seen a lot of examples of people not actually doing what makes sense, right? In the right, current. you know, we can't get out of our own way sometimes. I think uh, that brings us to the end of all the questions, Sophia. Thank you so much for your time, for your talk. Um, got us all to thinking, and uh, thanks to the audience for your questions and your participation. And we are looking forward to seeing you in two weeks' time for Lisa Edmonds' talk on the 24th. Thank you.